Bob now. I'm the CEO of, uh, of Boomi. And uh, my big epiphany, how I uh, decided to go into the world of entrepreneurship, I, I'm actually a, a sort of a recovering corporate uh, executive. So I did like 25 years in the corporate world and had run a number of different um, you know, business units and uh, a couple of different software companies. And we had a really uh, good run at one of the companies. We, we um, we took this company that wasn't doing so well. We put a lot of uh, effort and change into place, and you know we put ten record quarters back to back, and, and ended up getting a really uh, good exit for this company. And being uh, part of the part of the company, I, saw, I suppose you know, I had stock options, but it really wasn't uh, quite the uh, the same financial exit for me as it was for some others, let's say. And and that combined with just never feeling like I was the guy, you know, completely sort of responsible for the company. I was working for someone else. That at that moment, I was like, it's time to work for me. And and so uh, I was very fortunate to know the angel investor at Boomi. Uh, they were looking for a new CEO to come in and run the company. It was a chance for me to to take over something in a very formative stage and sort of put my fingerprints on it and and grow it and 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 transform it into what it is today moving it from a traditional software company to now one of the leading cloud infrastructure companies. It's been awesome. I've never worked harder. Uh, and for sure, I love it a thousand times more than, than what I was doing before. So that's, that's uh, why, I, why I made the change. What's my core skill set versus like the guys I, I work with, which is a great question. So I, I'm, I tend to think of myself as more of a generalist. You know, I, I'm not particularly deep in any one area, but I'm broad across a whole lot of different areas. And, and my business partner, Rick Nucci, who's the founder, the original founder and CTO of Boomi, is, is awesome technically, is an awesome business guy. And the thing, the, the synergy between the two of us is he will have the aha moments from a, from a technical standpoint, and I'm the guy that figures out how to take that technical stuff and translate it into layman's terminology and English and marketing and messaging and positioning that people, people kind of understand and, and can grasp very quickly. And that's, uh, that's kind of been my, the, the value add that I've brought. Did you guys work together in your previous company or how, how'd you? Yeah, we met, Rick and I met through the angel investors. So uh, the angel investor, a guy by the name of Mike West, was a client of mine years and years ago at EDS. He brought me in, uh, it was the first time I met Rick. Uh, I, I think if Rick were here, he would tell you he was very skeptical of me coming in from big corporate and, you know, uh, I think I was CEO number four or five, so he'd been through a few before me. Uh, but I think the difference was, and he, again, if he were here, I think it would, would, would tell you that I, I took the time to really study the company, study and learn the space, and I didn't just come to him with, uh, okay, here's what you need to do, and now I'm going to measure you doing it. I came to him with, here are my ideas around the space, what are your ideas around the space, and a very natural and now very, I would say, very deep friendship built up around that. And uh, you, you know we're we work very very uh, synergistically with each other uh, ever ever since. You have too little margin for error to hire a bad mm -hmm. sales guy or a bad technologist. So how do you evaluate people, bring them on board, and then um, kind of inspire them to to kick ass and take names and stay up till four in the morning getting things done? Yeah, yeah. Well, so. Uh, First thing I would tell you is I actually went through the same interview process that, that, that we put other people through. So even, even as CEO, when I was looking to come on board with Boomi, uh, they have a, we have a really good process whereby you spend, uh, you know, you do the individual interview, but then you have team interviews and, and you meet with a number of people across the organization. And uh, I was fortunate enough that I, I apparently did pretty well in the interview and, and so ultimately, you know, but I also felt very strongly like I shouldn't be outside of that process. If I'm going to be part of this team, I wanted to go through the same process that everyone goes through when they come into Boomi. And so that was, that was very important to me as well. Uh, one of the benefits of bringing a guy like me in is I have a pretty big network. And so I was able to fill a number of the key management team positions with people that I already knew, knew would gel really well with Rick and the culture at Boomi. And so, and even those folks, we still put through the interview process and we, and we still do today. But it was a, it was a definite advantage having people from my previous jobs and people who were proven you know, proven quantities and I knew would fit well with with the uh, and the people that I that that I certainly went after were people who were also entrepreneurs who in their hearts but were stuck in sort of you know corporate jobs who I knew were just dying for the chance and that opportunity to really take a chance and try something like this 
and you know they're they're loving it as well. Um, so I think, and in terms of ongoing inspiration, it, you know, uh, part of the process is getting people who believe in what you're doing and and really, you know, uh, sign up for the, uh, the vision and the you know the mantra of the company. Uh, and we're very upfront about that, and you know, and so that helps to sort of qualify people in or out. But generally, the guys who join Boomi absolutely you know love what we're doing, and uh, we'll uh, you know we'll work 24/7 to get things done. I'm Sinclair Schuler, co-founder and CEO of Apprenda. Uh, I think my epiphany moment came to, to me when I realized that as an engineer, former engineer and uh, technical guy, that uh, my DNA of solving problems and being able to take that solution and put it in people's hands would be amplified if I turned it into a business. It's kind of interesting because as an engineer and an architect, you're typically solving problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but the surface area of the solution is pretty limited. It's usually you know the few people you work with, the organization you're working for. And the idea that you can start a company and take a solution that you're passionate about and that you've, that you've worked on and that solves a pain point, more importantly, that you've experienced personally, is just enormous. It's an enormous motivator. And as it gets out into the market and you see it kind of reach fruition, all of a sudden it's an enormous reward also. Um, and I think that knack for wanting to solve problems and coming up with solutions is fundamental to any entrepreneur. And it blends well with uh, technology, which is why I think you see so many entrepreneurs in IT. Tell me about the transformation from the tech role to the business leader role. Yep. Uh, it's a huge question, hugely important also. You know, we've gone through a couple of rounds of funding, uh, we're venture capital backed, and you start to see that you have to transition with the company. As you start bringing people on board, you know, you have to put down your technical hat uh, and start looking at the operating role and understanding what the strategy is going to look like, what the, what the company is going to look like. And it's a struggle, you know, when you first uh, come into it and you have an engineering mindset, you get excited by the technology, as, as uh, Bob mentioned earlier, um, his co-founder, or in this case, uh, it was the same, you know, very excited about the te technology, lots of aha moments. So you have to sometimes suspend those and say, I have a new focus point. But what ends up really working is you reframe the problem, right? If you look at building a business, it's an engineering problem at the end of the day. You're trying to understand how to get in front of customers, how to build revenue streams, how to build profitable revenue streams, uh, even, even more important there. And when you treat it as an engineering problem, all the same fundamental skills apply. What are the solutions? How do you break it down? How do you solve it piecemeal? And how do you architect the business? And that's a term you don't hear often. People don't talk about architecting a business. Once you get that mindset, you satisfy all your engineering needs just in a different context. Did you have to kind of prove to the investors that you were the right guy to leave the company? No, I mean, I think it was, came pretty natural. You know, I'm, uh, my responsibility was raising money. And when you're pitching the company, if they're buying into the company, they're also buying into you. And they, uh, they see that and they understand that you are the business, uh, partly in terms from a leadership point of view. But the next piece is the type of business we're in. It's a highly technical product. You know, we sell to CTOs on a regular basis. I speak their language. Um, so the market, our market at least, is primed for technical CEOs. It works a lot better in this case. Uh, so I don't think there's any proving that went on. Um, there's always skepticism, you know, when they make an investment in general, and that includes the team and the company. But as soon as we get that commitment, we get a, a level of confidence from them. Can you talk about your thoughts on the differences between growing a business from zero dollars to a million dollars in revenue, and let's say the next step of a million to to ten million? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll kick it off. I think uh, the word scrappy is what comes to mind. You know, the first thing you have to think about is when you grow from zero to a million, uh, what do I have to do to get the job done? You know, there, there are different things you do in a business. Sometimes you worry about profitability. Sometimes you worry about revenue, you know, top line versus bottom line. In those early phases, market traction comes from people paying you money, not necessarily you saving a bunch of money, right? So I think the focus point becomes be scrappy, do whatever it takes to get those first customers, make them extremely happy. You need wild fans out there that are raving and that are talking about what you do in a really positive light. Then you use that as a leverage point for a million plus, right? Beyond that, that foundation kind of, I think, uh, sets the tone for what's gonna happen after a million dollars, how quickly it's gonna happen, and who you're gonna be talking to. You'll end up with weird properties. You know, maybe you put a lot of effort into a certain vertical and all of a sudden you're a specialized type of company because your first 30 customers were all over here. So uh, that will dictate what happens after a million dollars. And I think the, the biggest piece of advice is that, be scrappy from zero to a million, and then after that, strategize around how to leverage what you built in zero to a million to go beyond that. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think it's great advice. I was just smiling because, you know, I was realizing that in the corporate world, I w would routinely, we would close deals of a million or more, <laughs> or 10 million or more. And so, yeah, every once in a while, even though I love what I'm doing, uh, you know, and it's very satisfying, I take a step back. And, My goodness, it's taken a while to, you know, sort of ramp the revenue. Uh, but uh, I think that's right. I mean, when you're, you know, when you don't have the big company name and the big company reputation, you, you've got to start to build build one. And, and so it starts with those early believers and the early... Uh, the people that, that believe in you and, and take that early chance and like you say, make them raving fans, build the case studies, 
Uh, but I also think it comes from the people, and, and when you're in, in front of people, people buy from people at the end of the day, and uh, and so I think you have every bit, you know, uh, an opportunity with with your own personal brand and the you know the management team, whatever, to to uh, to sell as as you would at a big company. I mean. Uh, uh, we get past the viability questions, you know. We, we you know, we're funded. We have a board, you know. We uh, we've been around ten years, uh, you know. So that usually doesn't really come up that much. At the end of the day, it's more like, do I really think these guys can do what I what I need done, and do I, you know, do I trust them? And that's where we excel. Yeah. When you both first finally had a product that was saleable, can you talk about uh, how you came about pricing the product, and was there a Maybe a knee-jerk, maybe inclination to underprice it to win those first few customers, and how do you, I mean, you know, to tell somebody, hey, we'll sell it to you for ten dollars, they'll probably buy it. So, how did you come about pricing it, and how do you start to ratchet up the prices to where you want them to be? Yes, I, I would. I'll go first on this. I would say pricing was a huge part of our of our business model. Uh, we knew that we wanted to be disruptive in the space. Um, no one had ever done integration really as a as a SaaS platform before, and so we we were going to have some educating and some evangelizing to do. And so to just come out with, you know, a par technology at par pricing really really wasn't going to get it done. We needed to really come out and and make a statement. And we can do that with, you know, with a single instance multi-tenant platform, our cost structure is significantly less than our competitors. So by design, we came to market with, with you know, very economic pricing that fit very well with the SaaS industry. I mean, guys were selling, I mean, you know, I always tell this joke, Mark Benioff, you know, when he first probably proposed selling, you know, Salesforce for 50 bucks a month per user, when Siebel was out doing, you know, multi, you know, tens of millions of dollars implementation, probably thought he was crazy. And so we had sort of similar skepticism with what we were trying to do, but uh, I will tell you that once we set those price points, we didn't we didn't undercut from there. You know, we we I think again this is part of developing your your brand and your identity and who you are. Uh, if we felt the value was there, we would we would just say, look, if you if the pain's not enough there, if there's not enough need for this price point, you really probably don't need our offering. And we kind of drew a line in the sand. Once we had the traction, once we had the platform iterated, then we released, you know, Pro Edition, Enterprise Edition, new capabilities, and took our pricing, you know, up accordingly with uh, with the new capabilities and features. So you, you you stood fairly strong with we'd rather not have you as a customer than let you beat us up over price. Yeah. Because eventually we know you'll come back to us. And they or do. Maybe not. And and, mo and most of them do. Uh, and I think once that happens, there's a, there's this tremendous respect that you've just gained with that prospect that y you are a person of integrity and you're a company of integrity and you know, it, it really makes a difference. Yeah, on our, on our side, pricing was interesting for a couple of reasons. One uh, thing that I learned is pricing chase, it chases the business model. So we started off with one business model in general in terms of how we were going to distribute the software where we were actually a utility company. You know, we were going to be a cloud. Um, we ended up scrapping that once we realized that our demographic, the people that really liked our technology, were a lot bigger and they actually wanted to have nothing to do with that. So we moved to a package software model. And right away, that broke down. You know, whatever pricing decisions we made went out the window. So the whole pricing discussion was always predicated on what's the model look like, who are we selling to. And I think the next thing that came into play for us is that there was no way to shadow price. There's nothing like us on the market in terms of kind of unique technology. So it's hard to understand, well, what's the market doing right now because we were defining it. So the, we were doing some pricing trailblazing at this point. Uh, and we took the approach of we're packaged software now, you know, there's no cost associated with it, so doing cost-based pricing is really weird. Um, we shouldn't probably go down that path. What fundamentally do we solve for the customer? Let's understand what their pain point is, how much money do we take off the table for them, you know, how much do we save them, how much time do we save them, and what new opportunities do we generate? And we wanted to share that, you know, so if we save you X amount of dollars, we're asking for a piece of it, and that's our pricing. And the piece has to be, I think, appropriate enough where as a company, particularly as a startup, you can generate the cash flow that's necessary to be a good business. And your customer, interestingly enough, wants you to do that, right? Um, one of the things they want you to do is be around forever in most of these cases, so they want you to be a good business and they appreciate the pricing because of that. But it can't be high enough where you don't leave savings on the table for the customer. If you've done those two things, I think you've picked the right price point because you haven't undercut the pricing and you didn't kind of overshoot at all either. You'll, you'll find that uh, equilibrium point. And a lot of times you might start a little low. low. You know, I think um, it was JBoss not too long ago. Well, no, actually it was kind of long ago now, 10 years ago. Uh, when they first started pricing, their average account size was $30,000 a year. Uh, they ended up doing some interviewing once they brought in a new CEO, and the CEO was talking to their current customer base, and they said, yeah, so we actually would have been willing to pay you 70000 
they ended up within a year restructuring their pricing model so that the average account value was $70,000. So a lot of times you'll see that pricing isn't an issue. A lot of times it's too low because you haven't really assessed the customer's value. Their, their lens sees it very differently. And if you try to look at it through their lens, they'll A, pay the money, but B, also appreciate what you're giving them for that money. We just came through a really shitty, shitty time. What was the biggest lesson you learned last year? I mean, I think the biggest lesson we learned is that shitty times for everyone, or for the market, doesn't mean shitty times for everyone, really, is what's happening. Um, the, we had a recession, and that recession proved to be problematic for the market as a whole, but interestingly enough, it created certain cost pressures on people that forced them to look for solutions that would save them money. Okay? So the lesson I learned is that you can't always look at the market lens. You have to look at it with a, kind of a more micrographic lens and understand what specifically is going on in your space. Take the situation of a recession, try to project it, try to understand psychologically what happens, and the fact that that doesn't mean people will suspend a business altogether. Uh, typically speaking, what happens in a recession is that they just try to find more creative ways to do better business. If you're the solution or you're the creative answer, then you actually get a boost in business. And that's what we saw. We saw many more people wanting to move to software as a service um, via a non-traditional mean. They didn't want to build anymore because that would be expensive, so they discover stuff like us. I, I think for us, it, it uh, and for me personally, it just sort of validated that, that at the end of the day, fundamentals really still, still count. You know, you, you need to be, you know, selling, you need to be, you know, uh, growing the revenue, you need to be moving towards uh, a very healthy and profitable business. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that that it was, it was a quick wake up call, a quick reminder from maybe what we all, you know, had at the end of, uh, you know, the late 90s and, and before the bust that, you know, it's, it's still at the end of the day, you got to create real value. And so, wasn't an aha moment, but just validating. I'm really glad that we weren't way out over our ski tips in terms of hiring, you know, lots of people and and you know, huge sales and marketing programs. When when Sequoia did the whole you know death spiral deck, uh, I'm sure everyone's heard about. You know, we're cut half your staff now. We weren't in that position. You know, we uh, we really just kind of you know we might have slowed down a little bit what we were doing to ride out the the, the slowdown, but uh, we weren't in a place where you know we had to reduce by half. So I think just validating. At the end of the day, solid fundamentals uh, really are important. Okay, final question, just in terms of internal operations. Uh, what, for example, like uh, accounting software does each of you use, CRM software, uh, project management software, or other tools that you guys use with your team that you think, I mean, maybe you use a really boring CRM, but there's this other tool that you use that's really cool to do something. Uh, okay, so I'll kick that off. On the, on the software side, I think virtually everything we use aside from Microsoft Office is SaaS based. Uh, we use Sugar CRM, we use Demand Base for uh, prospecting, Pardot for market analysis, um, we use Basecamp for project management, Assembla for ticketing on the, on the R&D side. So I think we have a pretty eclectic portfolio of, of SaaS companies that we work with. Do you use Google Analytics? Uh, we do use Google Analytics, yeah, my director of marketing does so. Uh, personally, no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, organizationally we do. So in all these, interestingly enough, we go through uh, sometimes trying to figure out the integration hiccups where, where uh, Boomi comes in and says, hey, this is what we can do for you. Um, so that's that. our portfolio of software is around that. Interestingly enough, we don't use cloud infrastructure often. Um, in our case, we have massive testing requirements where we have to spin up two to 300 VMs on a regular basis and we need a lot of kind of bandwidth to make that happen. We have our own server racks that do that and in that case, that's something we don't do in sort of a sassy fashion. So on the hardware side, it's not so much uh, you know that, that we're using creatively third-party tools. We have fundamental needs that we have to account for. Are you also sassy with your productivity? <laughs> we absolutely eat our own dog food. So uh, we, uh, we have NetSuite uh, for the financials. We use uh, Salesforce for CRM and Salesforce automation. We use Marketo for marketing automation. Those are kind of the three core systems. Uh, and then uh, Gmail for email. We 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 are we literally and we integrated with Boomi, so uh, we we are literally in the cloud.